Lilith. Perfect. <laughs> okay, thanks so much for being here. Maybe before we start things off, um, who doesn't know what Eskilmet is? Okay, so maybe you can give us a, a short description of what it is for the people that don't know. Uh, sure, I mean, uh, we founded Ask Helmut about five years ago, and basically our motivation was to really motivate people to leave their sofa, break with their everyday routine, and discover the best events in town. So what we do is we recommend the best e events in town through our website and our app, and just recently we uh, launched a new product, it's called Helmut Surprise, and that means we sell surprise nights out. So you don't, uh, you don't necessarily need to take any decision on where to go out, you can only choose the day, and we choose the event, and it makes it pretty easy to really discover new artists and uh, places in your city. Has anybody tried it yet? Okay. Wow. So tomorrow everybody go on Eskilmut. <laughs> But how did you actually come to realize uh, that there is potential in this idea? How, how was the first sort of initial thought about this? Well, I have to admit, I, was, I met an old friend or a colleague. Um, we had been working on a project together and he's a musician and an artist. He plays with Materia, a pretty big German band. And um, he also worked in booking, so he kind of knew the side from organizers and w uh, the artist side. So he knew a lot of artists play um, without um, really or in in front of en empty rooms, and still their performance is really good. And on the other on the other hand, we all knew knew and from ourselves, of course, that it's really easy to see mainstream events in town, but it's really hard. Um, and there's such a great variety of niche, really cool events in Berlin in particular. So we have to make it easy and fun to discover these events and artists. So that's, we sat together and then f talked a lot about it. Uh, we had another, um, well, it was basically a group of 12 artists when I joined. And I thought, wow, this project can never ever happen. Like 12 artists. Uh, discussing about three hours about uh, the um, this word culture, if it really makes sense or not. And I was just following this and I previously worked as a consultant in Berlin and Beijing. And um, it was always about efficiency and productivity and really quick. And that was like a major talk. And I thought, thought like, wow, it's really nice to meet people who think in a completely different way, but still it, it's still a long way to go. And then we had another meetup and uh, things were getting yeah, a bit clearer. And in the end, there was a group of four of us, like one um, developer, one artist, um, one designer and me. And we thought those are four complementary skills. Let's do it really and start it off, kick it off and found the company. So that's basically how we started. But it's still a very interesting co-founding team. I mean, it's an artist and you're a, d a designer. She worked in theater before, right? Yes, I have to, uh, yeah, I have to say basically my three co-founders are, have all have an artist background or they play in bands or um, worked as um, professional dramaturgs and so on. And of course, our CTO is a developer, but he also plays in three bands. So I'm the only one who's not been on stages uh, in the cultural se sense. Um, so of course, it was an interesting, um, it's an interesting group, but I think that was kind of our recipe to really kick off this company because it was just four complementary skills, which is if we talk bootstrapping, kind of the only way to really get into operations without money. Like we could all put all our efforts into it and um, kick off the project without having any money to spend. How did you uh, bring the initial idea that you had while you were sitting and chatting with, with your co-founders to an MVP? Um, well, I think the, the initial idea, my, my co-founders had worked on it and thought about it about, about six months before I joined the project and before we founded the company. 
um, and they had pivoted a lot. Um, but then we were quite quick about, like, we knew we wanted really the best organizers and the best um, partners in town. And we tried various various things. Uh, for, like we kicked off with um, developing an app. Um, and we just started and developed it ourselves, like designed it ourselves. Um, called like about one, like we had a list of 100 partners and we wanted them all on board, like speaking Berlin, it was like Volksbühne, Schaubühne, then the smaller stages, some booking agencies, galleries, museums. Mm -hmm. And we thought this is exactly the mixture that Ask Helmut will stand for. And we basically really called them five times, six times until we had a, like a meeting. And then we convinced them and got them on board with our mission. Like back then, we didn't really have anything to show. We just told them about the idea and we said, like, we're going to launch in six months and we want you to be on board. So um, it was a very interesting time, definitely. So before, well, once you started building the app, did you before prototype anything or did you just straight ahead went and thought, okay, this is a great idea, we're just going to try it out? Um, yeah, we had um, some prototypes and discussed it also with external partners and so on. And um, my technical co-founder is a very good app developer and they had, um, he developed um, kids apps before and they were top 10 internationally in the app store and so on. So I think we all had some experience and then of course we got a lot of feedback from friends, from other people that we asked based on some sheets on paper and so on. But then we were pretty quick and were really convinced about our concept and then just developed it. Basically based on an idea which was mood, like we thought mood is the way to go to discover events, um, which was a very playful thing and everything was built around that idea. and. It took us about a year to find out that actually no one really um, got it, like, or no one really used it except for playing with it. So, I mean, we could have tested that a bit earlier, but it was a very good thing in the, in the beginning, yeah. How did you finance your, well, your life, basically, for the four of you at the beginning, because you didn't take any investments. So how did you stay alive while you were trying things out and building things? Um, we had all worked in good jobs before, so we knew we had about six months to 12 months to um, really focus on the idea and um, get the develop development and MVP started and kick off the project. And then some of us worked in parallel, or the musician still played in, um, in his band and so on. Um, but Basically, we had some money that we put into into it, which is very small, but um, and then basically financed our lives based on, yeah, what we earned before, and basically cut all costs that weren't necessarily needed or like necessary. Like what, for instance? I mean, it's. Um, it's a trade-off, basically, if, if I have to say, like, I, I bought quite a lot of clothes or, like, went out and, like, just spent, spent the money that I earned. And uh, from starting the company, you just uh, think twice about what you, if you really need to spend that money or if you want to invest it into your company and have a few more weeks, months, days to, uh, to be able to develop what you want. And that's... Um, that's not not really a decision, or I wasn't really conscious about that when we founded the company, but it just came, and I have to say, I was so lucky and I was so happy about founding the company and really doing what I want, so it didn't really affect me that much. But it does require some amount of courage to make such a shift in your life from having a stable job and income to bootstrapping and sort of living day to day, no? Um, yes, I would uh, definitely say so. And it took me, um, I don't know, two, three months maybe to uh, take that decision. But um, I'm kind of surprised myself that I can really deal with that that easily. So it's... I think I had never, um, I worked in a, in a, like a stable consultancy job for five years before that and um, we 
co-founded some startups with um, project partners and I was just feeling, I, I need, and then I kind of built up a subsidiary for my company in Beijing for one year or one year and a half and I kind of needed that to really have the trust in myself and uh, tell myself, okay, actually, it wouldn't be that different to do it for my own company. If I can do it for other for another company, I could actually also found a company company myself. So for me, it was quite important to have that experience first and work in this digital uh, sector and uh, in that kicking off startups, developing digital projects. At and I really wanted to do my own thing <laughs> after that. You got the startup bug. I would say so, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> How, um, what was actually at the beginning the most, maybe out of the top thing that you did to attract your first customers? Or what, what was initially the things that you did to try and uh, get it out there? Um, I would say, yeah, our marketing budget was extremely limited and we probably spent about 200 euros, which was still a lot for us <laughs> back then. No, but we, um, we um, invested those uh, 200 euros in stickers and we basically went through the city and maybe you have seen one of those stickers because they are still on some, um, I don't know, some sites here in Berlin. And we put we just put them everywhere, which doesn't really make sense because conversion from a sticker which just says "Ask Helmut" to the App Store and then to a download <laughs> is quite is quite long. Um, but still, it really helped us in gaining some visibility. And then um, the thing that was a bit more conversion driven is we worked a lot with artists. So same what I said to um, about talking to organizers and gaining those partners uh, that we really wanted. We had a network of artists before and um, then we talked to a lot of artists and convinced them about the idea and got them on board. So uh, for a few sold out shows, they provided us with uh, tickets so we could give them away via our Facebook page or they with, I don't know, some uh, international bands from the States or German bands um, promoted is it on a Facebook post and said, hey, our show is sold out, but you can, you still have a chance to win, ask Helmut. So that kind of got us a lot, like a, a huge boost, I would say, in the beginning. What is the thing that you wish you knew at the very beginning or a mistake that you did that you wish you had more information to sort of not go that way? Um, yeah, it's hard to say, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I would probably say, especially if we talk about bootstrapping today, um, we, after, like, we knew we had these six to 12 months to really um, focus on the project. And after that, we knew, okay, we are still not really earning money. And we tried a few ideas, but I think at some stage, like if you bootstrap a company, you really have to focus on earning money or becoming profitable. And for us, like especially in a market which needs a lot of uh, reach or you need a lot of reach to be able to monetize your, your product or your community, um, you really have to focus on that and I would say at some stage we kind of lost focus on that and we were so much mission driven like we started we kicked off the company and we found it basically rather mission driven than really profitability driven or because we really wanted to build a company which earns a lot of money and I think at some stage we kind of lost that focus and we could have saved some time in really pursuing that focus, which is really important when you bootstrap a company. Did you have some specific KPIs that you set after that uh, helped you not only have a focus, but also track more um, yeah, substantial growth in the uh, first phases of bootstrapping? Yes, of course, we set some KPIs um, and we also tested um, tested a lot of things and then measured how they performed. But then we trusted a lot of in, um, 
into our instincts and actually at some stage especially if you're that's also the difference to my previous work because that was basically a data or now developed into a data science uh, company and so on everything was about data and um we like being f like having four people you just don't have one person that's able to really analyze everything all the time and i would have loved to but at some stage you just you always have to decide how much am i able to really analyze and how much time do i put into really kicking off things and trying to um, have a bigger impact but there must be a, a balance right so yes of course but i mean of course we had some kpis that helped us track the process and uh, tell us okay there's still a zero uh, in revenue mm -hmm. so <laughs> that should uh, tick an alarm i mean uh, the reason why I'm asking this is because mostly startups, when they get investment, they feel pressure to not only deliver on what they're doing, but also to show a lot of data so they can prove to their investors they're doing something, which kind of puts um, this pressure of, uh, yeah, putting the booth in their asses, some would say. Yeah. <laughs> and But when you don't have anybody to uh, take a look in the back, it's something that you have to be driven yourself, right? So how did you maintain that? It, it's true, but on I would say in from for our case, um, we still have stakeholders that we have to, like we have to make, like our customers are the ones that basically we have to make happy. So, um, it's just a different different focus. So of course you you are more tempted to um, lose focus on KPIs, and that's basically it can be a bad thing, but it ca can also be a good thing because you can kind of experiment with ideas and be a bit more free in pursuing new ideas and uh, trying out something that maybe you haven't promised to an investor and now you have to deliver on those KPIs. And I mean, for us, it was definitely one reason why we uh, decided not to take an investor on board because we thought, I mean, in the end, we weighed the pros and the cons and we thought for our case, we bootstrapping is the right way. That's, that would have been my next question because I know you had uh, investors that approached you but you decided to go against it. Um, so this would be one of the reasons. Are there other reasons that, or can you give us some other pros to why you decided to bootstrap? Well, I mean, it was, was both both sides. We founded the company and we, um, as I said, we were rather mission driven and we had not a clear idea on how to make money and how we had some ideas, but not the clear direction. And we hadn't f like, the clear route on do we approach investors or do we do it our own way or like do we bootstrap the company it um, we then talked to some investors some accelerators and the feedback was very diverse like there were some who said uh, please just stop that business uh, you will never ever earn any money with it and we also had some uh, investors or some strategic investors who said from to from today on we're go gonna do it 50 50 and um or if you don't and i invest in your company or if you don't do it we're gonna do a copy and you're gonna be dead by three months or something like that so basically it was very diverse and we heard uh, lots of uh, different stories and so on and in the end I mean, we thought we have to do it our own way and really focus on the, on the things that we really find important, find our own way and um, kick the company off by ourselves. What gave you the confidence sort of, or where did you draw this ambition to step over the negative comments or the negative feedback? Um, I think, um, Maybe to a certain extent we were kind of naive, <laughs> but um, I think on the other hand we just got a lot of very positive feedback both from organizers, from users and of course from professional or also investors who said that there is a lot of potential. So we just really believed that there is a need and there is some traction and we saw it in our product as well. So we thought we just have to really promote it, um, yeah, get bigger 
and will find a way to monetize it. Can you, I uh, mean, the uh, tip about the stickers is very interesting that you just went out and did uh, something that you can't really track, uh, but it worked for you. Did you do some things, some other things like that that resemble? Can you give us other tips that maybe people who are thinking about bootstrapping can sort of take with them? Um, yeah, I mean, we had, uh, for us, yeah, one, one thing was the stickers, which were quite inexpensive, <laughs> and the other one was working with artists in ours. I think good partnerships and having influencers, artists, I don't know, or also partners who believe in your company and your project, that's a good way. And what we did is also to work with quotes from artists print out posters and then we um, put them up in the venues um, that we worked with. So basically we didn't have to pay for outdoor or like offline promotion. And um, that was also a very good way. So I, bas I also brought some posters if you want to, um, you, can, you can pick them up, <laughs> they're over there. Um, yeah, so that is, a, is something that worked well for us as well and then of course um, online promotion via artists and um, partners. Is it is that still your main channel? I would say yes. Yeah, it, it's a it's still a lot wor um, word of mouth. Then um, we also approach some people who have bigger bigger channels on Instagram and so on. Um, especially with our product with the surprise, invite them to do a surprise night out or do it once a month and talk about it or tell us how it went. So um, it's, yeah, it's still one of our main channels to, I mean, to really get those people on board, make them happy and then try to make them talk about it. I mean, if they have a good, if they have a good experience, they will recommend it to others, and that's basically the most sustainable and sustainable and um, organic growth that we have. I and then, ah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> one one other partnership uh, that's of course important for us is with a major um, newspaper called Süddeutsche in Germany. So we also spread and integrate content into our uh, into other platforms. So. For example, in Süddeutsche Zeitung, every day we have three recommendations on what to do in Munich, and um, we do that in s several cities as well. So you do it as uh, sort of complementary for them? Yes, it's um, basically, um, it's, um, yeah, we know what's going on, and they benefit from not having, um, well, having a pretty good partner on board and not having to do the work themselves. And um, and we send uh, those users back to our site to get more information. I have one more question and then I'll give the mic to you guys so you can ask. Um, I mean convincing users and partners, you have amazing partners which have, have helped you boot basically bootstrap what you're doing. Uh, one thing is of course your background and experience, but I mean that's ju just one fraction of it. How do you convince people of the idea when you have almost nothing or when you have just a very simple thing to show? Um, I would say it's probably a lot about your own enthusiasm and if you're really convinced of the idea yourself and I think if you really are then probably you can uh, you can even convince an investor or someone else without any uh, pitch deck or any product or whatsoever. I think if you really nail the pain point or the, the benefit and uh, the way to go, I would say it's probably the most important thing. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. Thank you well, for the beautiful you. answers. So guys, uh, who has a question now? Thank you. I have two questions. The first is because in Berlin we have city and tip and the, you know the newspapers yeah. and they used to have like a daily special so how you how you started up to say okay we do something special against that because somehow they had the market already and they had the product already and we're doing this and the second question would be how you do the the cash flow back 
to your company. I mean, I know about surprise, but you charge now the, the cultural events to be on you. So you, you swap, to the, swap to the, how you say, to the, no? <laughs> to the mainstream, yeah. to the big events. Okay, for um, your question concerning City and Tip, uh, when we founded um, City and Tip, had a very strong focus on offline, so they were very strong with the print magazine, and we just thought there's no, I mean, five years ago, we thought that there needs to be an app for everything, and we, we just thought there's no really inspiring and um, really inspiring way that tells me where to go. And so that's basically where we thought we can, we can do it better than them. Um, and um, or we could, we could also activate more and younger people for events that are um, not, not really mainstream. And uh, for your second question, as you said, surprise is one of the re revenue streams. And uh, the other one that helped us build the company and that is still strong is rather, I would say, an agency model where we work with brands um, to promote events that we believe are valuable for our community um, and have some specials and we help brands to um, promote these events or, for, or also sponsorship around these events. For example, we had a had a big vi video series uh, for Berlinale last year where we interviewed behind the scenes, uh, we did some in uh, interviews behind the scenes um, with um, actors and people from Berlinale and promoted it on our website and different uh, channels or we promote events. But no, we don't charge organizers to be uh, to promote their events on our site. So the basic, um, it's always free if we are convinced uh, that the event is valuable to our community or if it fits our community. I have a question that I'm almost embarrassed to ask, but I'll do it anyway. Okay, <laughs> now I'm curious. Um, I'm only asking this because I've had personal experience with this problem. How do you prep, and I wish your co-founders were here to answer this question too, by the way. How do you prep people in your personal life that you're starting a business? Because I know when I started my previous businesses, like one of the biggest issues I had was helping friends and partner understand the change that it's not going to be nine to five and that my professional needs and how I can give to other people so uh, personally would be slightly different because I'm an entrepreneur. Um, yeah, it's a good question, which, I mean, first thing that comes to my mind is when I tried to explain my parents that I was going to fo uh, found a startup and not have a stable income and so on and um, try to have their understanding for that and it just didn't work. I tried, uh, I tried it a lot of times and I think the last... Um, talk that convinced them was I, I just said if I don't do it now I'll regret it for the rest of my life and then they were like okay well <laughs> just you have to do it I get it now so do whatever you think it's is right so um, I don't know basically I think um, I also didn't know I mean of course I knew we, uh, it would be some crazy hours that we would have uh, and that private life and business life would mix up even more than it was bef or did before and I mean f for me it was a lot about like also sharing enthusiasm about it and the benefit from like founding a company like Ask Helmut is we can always I can always take my friends to pretty cool events so basically they were quite <laughs> it was easy to get them on board. Thank you for the nice talk. I was curious if you had a particular time or um, amount of money in your bank account in mind where if you hadn't made money by that point, you would stop? Or were you so convinced that you would have taken out credit cards and you know done the whole, the whole thing? 
Um, I would I would lie if I would say no that didn't exist because of course at some stage we also questioned if there was really enough traction and enough value for everyone to really build a business and we definitely had that point and um, we had some very intense discussions and um, yet we convinced each other and ourselves to to go on at that point and I think that was the point that I mentioned earlier where we at some stage lost focus and in really building a company at some stage it kind of started to feel like a hobby and then we just sat together had very intense discussions and said okay actually our goal now is we have to build a business like it's a great topic but now from now on there's also another focus because otherwise it's a hobby and then we can't put that much effort into it. Uh, hi, thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, I would love to hear more about, like you were four co-founders and that's quite a lot. Um, I would love to hear how, like, how was your inner process and like about making decisions? Um, was this like a democracy or was this like some one person that kind of was a deciding vote when you were like, indecisive about something or couldn't agree. Uh, yeah, it's just a kind of general dynamic of four very different co-founders. Yeah, um, yeah, it was a very big change to my previous work because uh, m in my previous work, I remember getting an email from my boss saying, um, he just forwarded the client and said, um, should we do and tralala, you know what to do. And I basically knew what to do. So I, that was the entire brief. And that's how we all thought in some way that we had one word and everyone had the same understanding. Now four co-founders with different backgrounds, we were really, it took us a long time to really have the same understanding of the similar word. Um, but that was a very good process. And once we had that, um, it it's th that was one of, and I still have to say it's still one of our core strengths that we have these different perspectives on things, but now we speak the same language and understand each other way better, and that took some time. Um, and decision-making, I have to say it's very, um, yeah, we have a very democratic um, way of deciding things that is sometimes leading to yeah, sometimes it takes a bit longer and sometimes we we have we can't do that democratic process but um, in general we try to do it that way if it's a, an important decision then uh, we talk to each other decide jointly and try to convince each other of the way to go yeah um, okay I have a, a last question to you um, I'm teaching entrepreneurship in high schools in Berlin, and I'm asking about your uh, corporate legal forms, how you started off when you had scratch say your own money. Um, did you start off with a one euro GmbH, like a limited, uh, yes. public li limited? Yeah, or how did you start off, because now you're a GmbH, so you must yeah. have some capital somewhere. Yeah, we started off as a one, one euro, or like we invested, uh, oh, for us it was 1,000 euros, um, but yeah, that's the way we did it, and I would say it's a very, very good start. And when did you um, We changed that with a cooperation that we did where it was necessary to, do, to go that step. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the recommendation of the surprise events, because for different people it's important to find the best event which suits the personal, the personal desires of the person. And how do you solve that problem? Is it just like a random recommendation? Is it with help of machine learning? How do you do it? Um, yeah, it's a very good, uh, good question and it basically summarizes the journey and the pivot of our company because when we founded the company we thought Helmut would be your best friend who gets to know your tastes and recommends personally your best events. And um, what we figured out in like we Every time we send one, someone to an event, or it, no matter if he wins tickets or buys a surprise and so on, we ask them how it was the, n the next day or he gets. Uh, and from that feedback, we learned that um, that most people valued Ask Helmut for discovering new events. And they said, I would have never gone there without you. So, And it was amazing. So we thought, 
let's go one step th further. We won't do any personalization anymore, but we do basically, we develop the anti-algorithm, anti which is called surprise. Um, we, uh, and we just send people to an event that they would have never, maybe never chosen themselves, or they might really love that artist. Because it's, it's basically about bursting bubbles and getting people out of their small bubble. People who might say, I, w I hate contemporary dance or ballet or hip hop. We just say, we don't really care. You're gonna have a great night. <laughs> And you just, you know, have to get out of your co comfort zone, get surprised, and you're going to do that. And the least you will have is a good story to tell the next day. So, and basically, that's exactly the feedback that we get right now. So, I would say most people really like that. And, of course, some people um, sometimes don't like it. Hi. I was interested how you got to find the name Helmut or Ask Helmut. Um, it's, it came from um, a discussion with, the, uh, with a British performer and he called us and said, hey, I just watched the movie Night on Earth. And I don't know, do you know the new movie? It's about Helmut Grokenberger, a German GDR uh, taxi driver who goes to New York and he's just a guarantee for a great and unexpected night out. So we thought, okay, and also there is there is a conversation which is very long uh, about like Helmet, is that your real name? What a fucked up name to be naming your kid Helmet. And <laughs> we just thought, okay, it's, it's somehow a fucked up name, but it's also quite interesting. So let's call it Helmut. Thank you so much for being here. Hey, 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 hey,